Hello everybody, my name is Jörg Lissmann from YouTube channel Juggler66 and I will today start reading the book Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy. Rulers of Evil is a useful knowledge about governing bodies and this first reading will be an introduction into the book. I will be starting with a preface, then comes the foreword and after that an orientation written by F. Tepper Saucy himself that gives you any direction where this whole book is going to be about. And then in the next video I will deal with chapter 1 of the book. But before I start reading the book itself there is on page 4 of this book that can be found on the internet by the way for free you can download the PDF and then read along because I also use the PDF that I downloaded for free from the internet and you can follow, so you don't even have to buy the book, but you can follow the reading uh, when you download the book and I will put a uh, download link into the description box of the video. And this book starts with a very interesting quote made by President William J. Clinton, or better known as Bill Clinton, the President of the 90s of the United States of America, made on CBS News on March 31st, 1999. Quote, The worst thing you can do in life is underestimate your adversary. And I think he couldn't be more right when stating this very important fact. That is what people do not know today. They do not know who their adversary is. They look always left and right they look to the bankers, they look to the Jews, they look to the Zionists, they look to Israel, they look to Islam, they look to ISIS, they think that the Antichrist is Obama, even there it is very, very clearly stated in the Bible who the biblical, prophetic and historical Antichrist is, but that would lead us much too far to go into more detail here right now. But the point that Bill Clinton was making, not to underestimate your adversary, that also starts with beginning to know who your adversary is. And that is one of the main reasons why F. Tepper Saucy wrote this book. To tell not only the American, but surely the American people, who their adversary is, who are really the people who rule them. On the one thing, who they think who rule them, and on the other other side who really rule them and this will be made very very clear when we read and study this book from F. Tapasosi, Rulers of Evil. Just another quote from me, a little one, that is about uh, the quote that Bill Clinton just made in 1999. I find that very interesting that uh, he made this quote, never to underestimate your adversary and that it was Bill Clinton because Bill Clinton thought he had a very great adversary in the form of another Bill, Bill Cooper. Bill Clinton warned in the 1990s the Americans that Bill Cooper was, according to his opinion, the most dangerous radio host in the United States of America. And why is that? Well, that is most and for all because Bill Cooper was addressing issues other so-called truthers never touched. And that's why he thought that he was very, very dangerous. And of course, Bill Cooper then later on got dealt with in the night of November 5th, 2001. Remember? Remember the gunpowder plot, the 5th of November, a day never to be forgot. That they chose that date to kill him is not only cabalistic, but very profound when you know that you are dealing with the so-called Illuminati, which is just a front organization of the so-called Jesuits, the Society of Jesus. And they are playing quite an interesting role in this book. But I don't want to jump ahead of the facts here. I want to start now with reading to you the preface of the book Rulers of Evil. The only people in the world, it seems, who believe in the conspiracy theory of history are those of us who have studied it. While Franklin D. Roosevelt might have, uh, might have exaggerated when he said, 
quote, Nothing happens in politics by accident. If it happens, it was planned that way, unquote. Carol Quigley, Bill Clinton's favorite professor at Georgetown University, boldly admitted in his Tragedy and Hope, a book of consisting of 1,363 pages from 1966, that A. The multitudes were already under the control of a small but powerful group bent on world domination, and B. Quigley himself was part of that group. Now, very interesting to know in this uh, matter is, of course, that Bill Clinton was educated by Carol Quigley, and we just dealt with what Bill Clinton had to say about the adversary of Jesuit Georgetown University. Internet conspiracy sites strive to identify the conspiratorial factions. We get pieces here and pieces there. The world is run by Freemasons, some say. Others say skull and bones and a loose confederation of secret societies. CIA gets a lot of votes, along with Mossad, though I suspect these factions are merely tools. And, of course, the British. A major frontrunner is the international banking cartel. When Victor Marston published the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in 1906, which purported to be a Jewish plan to take over the world, Jewish writers denied responsibility, charging a Catholic plot to defame Jewry. Whose side was Marston on? You can get so deep into conspiracies that the suspects start cancelling each other out. It can become frustrating. I am happy to report that F. Tupper Saucy has come to our emotional rescue. During his ten years as a fugitive from the Department of Justice, convicted of a crime that cannot be found in the law books, Saucy occupied himself with an investigation into the powers that be. It was an investigation the likes of which, as far as I know, has never before been undertaken. The fruit of his amazing legwork is Rulers of Evil, a powerful book that in less loving hands <clears throat> might have been angry and judgmental. Saucy's thesis is the following. There is indeed a small group that runs the world, but we can't call it a conspiracy because it identifies itself with signs, mottos and monuments. Signs, mottos and monuments, you ask? Quick, what occupies the highest point of the US Capitol building? It's probably the most oft-published statue on Earth, and you can't name it? As long as you don't know whose feet are firmly planted atop your country's legislative center, or how she got there, or whence she came, the group that controls America remains invisible. Once you know these things, the fog begins lifting. Saucy has analyzed hundreds of signatory clues left by the true rulers of the world, clues that we have perhaps been training to ignore. Trained to ignore, sorry. <laughs> He's traced them to their origins and matched them to facts of history going back 6,000 years all balanced against the most reliable human reference work there is, the Bible. The result? An unavoidable touchstone for all future works on the subject. Rulers of Evil is an indispensable study book that you'll probably differ from cover to cover with highlighting. By all means, keep it on your lower library shelf within close reach of inquisitive children. This came from Pat Shannon, journalist at large from Media Bypass. We will now turn further to the foreword. Whether or not it's appropriate for a literary agent to write his client's foreword, I don't know. If I'm breaking the rules here, well, this is a rule-breaking book. Example. During last spring's book expo in Los Angeles, I agently introduced my client, Tupper Saucy, to one of New York's most unshockable publishing executives. As Tupper articulary summarized rulers of evil for him, I personally witnessed the brow of this fearless executive develop a twitch. I saw him actually gulp. 
With my own ears, I heard him say, quote, This is a little too extreme for us. Unquote. The twitch developed, as Tupper was saying, quote, The Roman Catholic Church really does run the world, including the United States government, and this is openly declared in monuments and emblems and insignia as well as official documents. Unquote. By the time Tapper calmly reached his payoff, quote, and this is good, because it's divinely ordained, the exec was staring into, staring into space. All right, rulers of evil is extreme. Does that frighten you? It was researched and written during a decade of flight that probably saved the author's life from vindictive federal authorities. I wanted to represent this book from the moment I read the first draft in 1993, completely unaware that its author could claim the classic Miracle on Main Street as his own. Taposaucy's identity was not revealed to me <clears throat> until his capture in 1997. He can keep a secret. Like no book I have seen in my 30 years of literally agenting, Rulers of Evil lays out who's really who in world powers, pegs them as evil, about as evil as the rest of us, more or less, and then explains how spiritual wickedness in high places works for the ultimate good of mankind. It's the book about conspiracies that doesn't advocate throwing the bums out. Rulers of Evil is almost a self-help product. The useful knowledge it imparts reveals the world structure as it really is. Once we can see, our choices increase, our pathways widen and our lives improve. But don't expect a breeze. Parts of the book are so rich in historical detail that your brain might feel overburdened. When that happens, just flip to a more readable part. Or study the pictures. My client doesn't mind being read casually, back to front, front to back, middle out, a few pages at a time. Enjoy freedom of movement. If a chapter doesn't fit today's mood, find another one that does. Use a bookmark or the dust jacket flaps. Ultimately, <coughs> sorry, ultimately you'll get it all. And when you do, I predict you'll be a different person. You'll have a new world view. One shaped by evidence that has never been assembled quite this way before. I can say this with confidence because Rulers of Evil is still influencing my own life, having begun in me a process of answering many of the heretofore unanswerable questions of our time. And this was written by the agent of F. Tapasaucy, Peter Fleming, from the Peter Fleming Agency. Now follows a part called Orientation, written by F. Tapasaucy himself, to go a little bit deeper into explanation how he came even to the idea of writing this factual book. Don't forget that I am not reading a novel to you. These are all facts, and all facts are backed up by documents, and you can look that up for yourself when you as I always say on my YouTube channel to my listeners and viewers to my videos, please do your own research. I am here to try to help you to see what direction your research can go into, but do your own research. Don't rely on me, I am just a man. Rely on yourself and of course, very important, rely on Jesus Christ. Orientation. Quote, the only thing new in this world is the history you don't know. Unquote. Who said that? President Harry S. Truman. On freshman orientation day at the University of South in Savony, Tennessee, I took a seat across the table from my faculty advisor. He was a professor of botany named Edmund Berkeley. Dr. Berkeley studied the tap on my Manila file folder as though it were some rare species of leaf. Suddenly his eyes leapt into my face. 
Giddy 18 years old that I was, I gulped and tried to smile. Saucy, he mused calmly. Good Huguenot name. The word stumped me. Huguenot? Saucy is a French name, he lectured. Sewanee is a Protestant university. Your people must have been Huguenots. I silently forgave my father for never having told me our name was French, and that our, that our ancestors might have been something called Huguenots. So, what exactly are Huguenots, I required. French Protestants, declared my advisor, massacred by soldiers ordered by Catherine de' Medici in cahoots with the Jesuits. The survivors were exiled, some established in England, others in Prussia. Some came to America, as your people obviously did. Jesuits. Now, that was a familiar word. In Tampa, my hometown, there was a high school named Jesuit. Jesuit High was greatly esteemed academically and athletically. I was aware of a connection between the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church, but little else. What are Jesuits? I asked. Oh, the Jesuits are members of the Society of Jesus, he replied. Excellent men. Intellectuals. They work exclusively for the Pope, take an oath to him and him alone. Some people call them the Pope's private militia, kind of a swordless enemy, uh, army, sorry, controversial. They've gotten into trouble meddling with civil governments in the past, trying to bring them under the Pope's dominion, you know, <laughs> but in this century they've been tamed down considerably. They're wonderful educators. That night I called my father, who answered Dr. Berkeley's surmise. Yes, our people were Huguenots. They arrived at Savannah Harbor in the, later, in the latter half of the 18th century, after a stopover of several generations in Scotland. They had indeed been run out of their beloved country, the same way the Jews were run out of Germany. Nazis chased the Jews, Jesuits chased us. Ah, but that was a long time ago, my father said, and I agreed. Forgiveness is a great virtue and it's best to let bygones be bygones. So I forgot about the Huguenots and the Jesuits and plunged into my college career, my future, my life. I never had occasion to think about my conversation with Edmund Berkeley until some 30 years later, in August of 1984, during a brief but telling encounter with an assistant United States attorney by the name of John McCoon. We were standing a few paces apart in the marble hallway outside the federal courtroom in Chattanooga, waiting for the morning session to be called. I was on a docket, scheduled to be arraigned on charges of willful failure to file income tax returns for the years 1977, 1978 and 1979. I had no doubt that the charges would be dropped. The statute I had supposedly run a fall of applied to persons quote unquote required to file returns. Yet I possessed a letter signed by the IRS district director stating that a diligent search of IRS files had failed to disclose any tax liability in my name for those years. People who have no tax liability are not required to file returns. Why was I there? The booming voice of a lawyer friend broke my concentration. Tupper, he said, guiding me over to John McCoon. Have you met your prosecutor? He introduced us in a jovial fashion and then rushed off to a huddle of other litigants. McCoon and I shook hands. John, I asked, feeling the need to make small talk. Are you from Chattanooga? No, he replied. I came from Washington. Something inside me told me to press. So you're originally from Washington? No, originally I'm from New Orleans. Oh, sorry, New Orleans. <laughs> I have lots of cousins in New Orleans, I beamed. He seemed to get a little edgy. Well, the name Saucy is not unknown there, he said. 
One of my favorite cousins lives in New Orleans, I said, and named my cousin. He's your cousin? Why, he and I were ordained together. Ordained, I asked? My cousin is a Jesuit priest. Are you a Jesuit? Yes, said my prosecutor, now visibly agitated. You know, I might have to recuse myself. I've got a better idea. Drop the charges. Oh no, I couldn't do that. The dialogue ended suddenly, with the hoarse draw of a bailiff announcing that the court was now in session. So John McCoon was a Jesuit. The media, spoon-fed by his offices, had already branded me a quote-unquote tax protester. What was going on? Were the Jesuits chasing protestants again? Actually, I had not protested any taxes at all. I had merely discovered some truths about the tax and monetary laws and had dared to stand on them. As with the Huguenots and the truths they have discovered about Christianity, authorities were offended. Wasn't it interesting that both of us, my ancestors and me, were branded as antisocial, repugnant, as people who disturb good order by daring to protest? Was this a religious persecution here? Was my stand on truce somehow so offensive that the Pope had dispatched one of his swordless warriors to do me in? And then here was the date. The charges against me were filed on July 31st. That happens to be the feast day of St. Ignatius Loyola, the founding father of the Society of Jesus. According to the dogma of Roman liturgical calendar, any cause initiated on a saint's feast day is especially worthy of the saint's attention. A bizarre series of furtive proceedings occurred over the next 11 months. Exculpatory evidence was ignored or suppressed. There were prosecutorial improprieties, <clears throat> which the court excused. When I attempted to avoid the consequences of the improprieties, I was punished. Few precedents for such judicial steamrolling could be found outside the annals of the Roman Inquisition, which I learned had been administered since 1542 by the Jesuits. What was this? The American Inquisition? All the while, the IRS, John McCoon and the media kept labeling me tax protester. Sometimes they would slip and call me a tax evader, even though I had never been accused of the much more serious crime of tax evasion. Ultimately, a jury acquitted me of willfully failing to file income tax returns for 1978 and 1979. But for 1977 they found willfulness, and the higher courts upheld their verdict. It was only a misdemeanor. The last defendant in my district to be convicted on the same count had been sentenced to six weeks. But the court sentenced me to a full year, the maximum allowed by statute. This was due to what the prosecutor called my quote-unquote unrepentance. Some say I should have wept crocodile tears and promised to mend my ways. But that would be game-playing. How can you repent of willfully failing to do something that was never required in the first place? When I soberly reviewed the long list of prosecutorial absurdities, I decided that I was being punished for something not remotely connected to willfulness in filing tax returns. I was being punished for mobilizing what turned out to be the only constitutional issue no court in the United States will fully entertain, the money issue. Back in the late 70s, I discovered that constitutional government was contravening every American's right to an economy free of fluctuating monetary values. I wrote a book, The Miracle on Main Street, Saving Yourself and America from Financial Ruin, in 1980. 
in which I compared American money as mandated by the Constitution, gold and silver coin, with American money currently in use, notes, computer entries and base metal tokens. Not only was the money in use inferior to constitutional money, but also it had been introduced without a constitutional amendment. Since our values were denominated in units of lawless money, we had become a lawless nation. Quality of life follows quality of money. I urged the people to take the initiative in nudging government officials to restore the kind of monetary system established by the Constitution. The ultimate payoff would be a wholesome society. Mainstream activism would have worked a miracle. From there, the title of the book, I insert. Miracle on Main Street caught on very quickly. Activists began asserting economic rights in many creative ways. To assist and document their work, I launched the Main Street Journal, published more or less monthly. The Main Street Journal reported in detail the interesting, sometimes frightening consequences of economic rights activism. By July 1984, my book and my journal had expanded into a growing bibliography of historic and legal materials related to the money issue. I was speaking all over the country and holding well-attended seminars in Tennessee. We had history on our side. The framers of the Constitution had anonymously voted down the kind of monetary system that was destroying modern America and had anonymously voted for the system we were advocating. We had the law on our side. The Supreme Court had never ruled that America's lawless monetary system was constitutional. What we didn't have on our side was the entity having most to gain from lawless money, the governing bodies. We were deeply offending their appearance in, uh, of legitimacy. As one Tennessee village lawyer said, in returning Miracle on Main Street to a friend who'd loaned it to him, quote, This book won't get saucy killed, but they'll figure out a human way of shutting him up. Unquote. There was an interval of two years between my trial and the Supreme Court's decision on it. About midway during that interval, I received a postcard, postcard from the most famous prisoner in Tennessee, James Earl Ray. Mr. Ray, the self-convicted assassin of Dr. Martin Luther King, wanted me to help him write his autobiography. I interviewed him personally, examin uh, examined his manuscript, and conducted some research of my own. The evidence persuaded me that Mr. Ray did not deserve to be called, in Life's magazine's words, quote, the world's most hated man, unquote. He had been tortured into pleading guilty. Far from punishment for murder, his confinement was the government's way of concealing the true assassins, and at the Tennessee taxpayer's expense, I felt that he, like myself, was being maliciously used by governing bodies for the purpose of deceiving the public. I worked closely with Mr. Ray, publishing his autobiography under the title Tennessee Waltz, The Making of a Political Prisoner. I included an epilogue of my own, quote-unquote, The Politics of Witchcraft, in which I discussed how Dr. King's murder benefited no one as much as it did the economic powers of government. About a month before Tennessee Waltz would be, become, would be coming off the press, I was notified that the U.S. Supreme Court had denied my appeal. Then the district judge ordered me to surrender myself to Atlanta Federal Prison Camp on or before April 10, 1987. A friend happened to say, quote, You know, if your previous writings brought about the tax prosecution, Think what Tennessee Waltz might provoke them to, with you in custody." Unquote. And so, when the moment came for me to pass through the prison camp gates, something got in the way. <laughs> something got in the way. I can only call it a spirit, an irresistible spirit. 
It was the same spirit that had directed me to stand on the truth in my writing and speaking. It was the same spirit that had led me to interrogate John McCoon at our first encounter in that marble hallway back in 1984. The same spirit that had moved him to tell me he was a Jesuit. This spirit turned me away from the prison gate and led me into a fugitive lifestyle. I felt an overwhelming obligation to love my enemies by studying them in intricate detail. I wanted to know the extent of Jesuit involvement in the United States government, presently and historically. What I discovered was a vast Roman Catholic substratum to American history, especially the revolution that produced the Const Constitutional Republic. I found that Jesuits played eminent and underappreciated roles in moving the complacent New Englanders to rebel against their mother country. I discovered facts and motives strongly suggesting that events that made Great Britain divide in 1776 were the outworkings of an ingenious Jesuit strategy. This strategy appears to have been single-handedly designed and supervised by a true founding father few Americans have ever heard of, Lorenzo Ricci, known to British Jesuits as Lawrence Ricci. In fact, Investigating Jesuit involvement in the formation of the United States turned up a whole host of here there to little known names such as Robert Bellarmine, Joseph Amiot, the Dukes of Norfolk, Daniel Cox, Sun Tzu, Lord Bute, Francis Thorpe, Nicholas von Hontheim, and the Carols, Daniel, Charles and John. In their way, these men were as essential to our constitutional origins as Jefferson, Payne, Adams, Washington, Locke and George III. My investigation began in 1987. It coursed ten years and ranged, with the help of our Lord and many courageous friends to whom this book is dedicated, from the Florida Keys to Puget Sound, from the District of Columbia to Southern California. The mounting evidence inexorably changed the way I perceived constituted authority and my relationship to it. Finally, on the 13th minute, on the 13th hour of the 13th day of November 1997, the journey that had begun with the filing of charges against me 13 years earlier reached its destination. I was captured without violence by three U.S. Marshals outside my office on the canals in Venice, California. A valuable personhood I was prepared to deny forever was given back uh, I was prepared to deny forever was given back to me. For sixteen months, the Bureau of Prisons afforded me the opportunity to discuss the fruits of my investigation with intelligent prisoners in California. Georgia, Tennessee, Oklahoma and Mississippi. Their straightforward questions, comments, insights and criticisms helped further prepare my manuscript for a general audience. Now that my liberties are fully restored, I am able finally to relate my findings to you in my own true voice, tried in adversity, reasoned, seasoned by time. F. Tapper Saucy this ends the orientation to the book Rulers of Evil and we will start when you go two pages down you will see his um, uh, drawing of Time magazine from the 18s of the Holy Alliance how Reagan and the Pope conspired to assist Poland's solidarity movement and hasten the demise of communism. Well the Holy, the Holy Alliance, when you go to my YouTube channel, Jogler66, uh, you know that I've made uh, videos about that uh, under the name of Hour of the Truth that you can follow there. And uh, I advise you to check that out. But I have come now to the end of the first reading, meaning the preface, the foreword, and the orientation by F. Tapper Saucy. 
If you liked it, I would appreciate it if you give the video a thumbs up. I also appreciate your comments that you can put in the comment section of the video. And I would very much appreciate it if you jump to the download link that I will provide you to, to get the book Rulers of Evil. Not only because this is uh, downloaded via the website uh, granddesign.com uh, from my very good friend and brother in Christ, Walt Stickel, who is also supporting me in doing this book reading here. And that is also the reason why this book will be also, this book reading also will be published on um, Mystery Babylon News Radio on Block Talk. And there we have sections of 45 minutes, so this is why no reading will go over 45 minutes. I will rather cut them short or cut them in two or whatever. Well, I try to keep it 45 minutes. So, having said this, I'm going to take a few days break from the reading. I hope you enjoyed the preface, forward and orientation and made you hunger for a little bit more. If you can't wait, no problem. Just download the book, read it for yourself, and if you like to, come back to my next reading. I would very much like that, and I welcome your comments on this. So, thank you very much for listening, thank you very much for watching, I hope to see you next time, and until that time, God bless you. Bye-bye.